Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back in our Father's Word. And chapter 3, the great book of Genesis. I want to say a word before I begin today. Um, many people just love labels. You know, like, well, this is the way so-and-so teaches. And if a man teaches this way, it ought to be, he's probably a so-and-so, you know this denomination or that. Hey, it doesn't matter what this person or that person teaches, how much of it or how little. What matters is what does the Word of God say. And anyone that will bend from teaching God's Word exactly as it's written, uh, don't try to label them. Uh, I don't care if it if it is different than locally you might have been taught, then maybe you'd better dig deeper. But what is important is to document it, know that it is God's Word, and I don't care what man says about it, stick with God's Word, and you'll always be a winner. Labels, I kind of dislike labels. I like to be a child of God that studies God's Word, period because there's nothing really important in this world shaping your morals, your success, as God's Word will. So always stick with it, and don't care a whole lot about what men say, all right? I hope you realize I'm preparing you for a chapter that um, it goes to some depths, and many people shy away from controversy but anyone that would call God's Word a controversy, or, or better yet, I should say, would shy away from it, is just a little bit too out there for God. He's not going to visit them. Always teach it exactly the way it's written. Okay, here we come back to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to begin with verse 1. Remember the creations of the six-day man? Uh, that uh, Remember the creation after the rest of the seventh day? that we had eighth ha Adam, the eighth day man created, uh, that specific one, then certain domestic animals, and then his wife. And that's where we left it. Let's pick it up now with chapter 3, verse 1. Let's go with it. Uh, with the word of wisdom from our Father and much understanding, verse 1 reads, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had created. He was smarter, always stewing around, trying to take advantage. And he said unto the woman, I thought he found maybe a weak spot here. Well, would he be surprised? Yea, hath, watch Satan's method of operation. He's always quoting God. That's what he did before Jesus when he tempted him. Yea, hath God said... Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, question. Now, that's, that's wide open. Oh, don't forget, God gave orders, and that after God states it, that becomes law. God had told them, you can eat of every tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and naturally, they did not have the... the um, um, opportunity to partake of the tree of life, which is to say Christ. We're going to be talking about trees at quite length today, and God uses symbology oft times to teach on a deeper vein than many people are able to receive. So let's hang tough. That's what Satan asked her. That isn't what God said to Eve, all right? Let's see what the woman says. Two, and the woman said unto the serpent, Ye, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, it becomes very important that you know what it eat and touch. You really need to know what this word touch is because it's kind of like as I told you in the beginning, if you don't start the truth 
Like, for example, if you were opening a feed sack or a flour sack, if you don't get the twine or the thread started right, you're going to have it all hacked up. So you need to know exactly what God said, what God had spoken concerning uh, the serpent in this tree. Okay? So, if we may, let's have, for the moment, the word touch in the Hebrew tongue. And there you have it at the bottom of your screen. It's naga in the Hebrew tongue. It's a prime root properly to touch, uh, lay the hand upon for any purpose, and then you have an abbreviation for a, euph a euphemism to lie with a woman by implication to reach and so forth. Now, that will do it. You know what, a, what, what then is a euphemism? A euphemism is where someone uh, uses the word touch to be a nicer word than they chose to translate to lie with a woman. In other words, it was nicer, it seemed, to say touch rather than intercourse. Well, that's what it means. And now many might say, oh, dear Lord, did you hear what he said? I didn't say it. God said it. That's what the word means in the Hebrew tongue. And if you're too good for God's word, then you're really a goody-goody two-shoes, aren't you? You need to stick with God's word so that you understand God's word. Now, um, so what God had said, I think the implication is sufficient that, um, that uh, it will clear itself up. Don't get away from me now. This is a little heavy for some. You put it on the shelf. But it is God's word. And I give you and tell you how to acquire the tools. If I say naga means a certain thing in Hebrew, you can check it out yourself in a strong concordance or a good Hebrew dictionary. It's not that uh, big a push for an English reader. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Well, now, here he lies. Ye shall not surely die. But what, you know, uh, God had already told them, you will. So who are you going to believe? Now, basically, this is what life is, comes down to. Uh, you make your own bed. It wasn't God that brought death into the world. Well, could we say, well, it was Eve. No, it was Satan. But Eve, by not being obedient to God, as well as Adam, did bring death in the world through Satan. Satan, of course, being. Now, um, we have uh, covered this here, and um, in this verse 4. And we see here, what, what does it mean? How can, we, how can we understand then touch? Can we verify that just a little bit more, what it's talking about? Well, we certainly can. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Just hold your place there. We're going to make a little side trip here over to the second book of Corinthians in the New Testament. You got it. And we're going to go to chapter 11. And let's understand this um, word touch just a little bit more, all right? And let's go with it. Let's pick it up, if we may, in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians. Paul teaching, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you, that's engaged you, to one husband. That would be Christ, of course that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That is to say that you won't be deceived, you won't be beguiled, but that, um, and the subject is the loss of virginity here. In a spiritual sense, here you bet. But listen to it carefully, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, it's very important that you know, what is this word beguiled? Now, it, it is the exotio in the Greek. 
And it comes from 1537 and 1538. It has one meaning only, the two words, to seduce wholly, completely. It doesn't have any other meaning. Thus, let it be settled in your mind, verified even in the New Testament, as to what we're talking about in the garden from the Hebrew word naga, as well as the beguiling of Eve. Now, if we were to continue on in this uh, 11th chapter, we would find, let it be no marvel, for in the end times, Satan himself will come, the English word transformed in verse 14, but it's disguised. Satan's subtle, he's always disguising himself. So it is in the Greek. So, uh, a person, many might say, well, that's certainly spiritual. No, it isn't. It is using an actual event so that 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 is spiritual for you can be brought to pass in your life before the spurious Messiah without being seduced by him spiritually whereby you're not deceived. And uh, certainly we'll go a little deeper into this when we come to the sixth chapter of Genesis concerning the event. Okay? So... Having said that, let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Let it flow. It is God's word. And that's what you need to know. Verse 5 reads, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, Satan continues speaking, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, you will find enlightenment. Now, let's hold on just a minute. Satan is really, you know, never trust Satan, number one. And what does it mean? You'll be like us, the angelic beings. You will know good from evil. At this time, Eve is created innocent. But I don't want you to forget the comment that your eyes shall be opened. And I'll document for you that certainly, rather than an opening, what was about to transpire brings about a closing. I want to call up the word tree as it is used of eating all of the fruit of the garden. Okay, let's call up the word tree as it is utilized there. And it will be the Hebrew word 6086. Do we have that on the monitor at this time? The Hebrew word 6086. Or whichever Hebrew word you might have there will be fine. Is it another verse down? Are we... If I can, I'm going to hesitate just a moment if the director can tell the, a camera person. Is it another... Have we got our verses crossed or what? coming up. Okay, we'll have it here in just a second. I'll continue talking until we get here. You need to know how God uses the word tree. It's very important. God uses symbology, whereas with symbology, he is able to say more than is written and also to protect tender ears from that that um, he would say. And um, certainly, um, we find that, as I will document here in a moment, that it is not unusual for ourselves to address tree as uh, our own bodies, our own personage. God even called Satan a tree in Ezekiel chapter 32 when he was talking to Pharaoh. And instead of calling Satan a cedar of Lebanon, which is the tree that is symbolic of our people, he called him a tiasha in the Hebrew tongue, which is, means a plain old box cedar. You try to be something really special, but all you are is an old box cedar. So um, it's not unusual for God to refer to men as trees. Now here is the word that is um, utilized in the Hebrew tongue, etz, or etz, and it comes from 6095 in the Hebrew dictionary. A tree from its firmness, hence wood, or it could even be sticks. Now let's go to that 6095, if we may, if we have it there following that, that, um, that the word tree comes from. It's prime 
whereby we can recognize it. Again, as I state, as it's coming along, and please have 6096 ready for me after that, uh, that God utilizing trees, calling Satan a tree, we're going to take this to the, the, to the fact that what do you call your arms? Do you not call them limbs? And what about the torso of the body? What is it called? The trunk, of course. So there's nothing new under the sun. And it is not all unusual at all for a person to um, use even God's uh, vein of, of, of his thought, that is to say, and to think in the vein in which he would think, that he utilizes... Uh, Trees. Now, the tree we just covered that is good and bad, an oak tree knows enough that when the first frost hits, it sheds its leaves and they fall in the, uh, in the, uh, to the ground. It knows the sap's got to go down or it'll freeze up and so forth. Uh, and, but a tree that has knowledge of good and evil, we need to go a little deeper. So here we have the word, the prime from which the word ets comes from, and you will notice it is... Atash, it is a primitive root, properly to fasten or to make firm, and this is what I want you to get from it, to close the eyes. What did Satan say? Surely your eyes will be open. So he lied again. Now let's go on, if we may, to 6096 from the language there. And we find here, note it's also from 6095, so that you get the full picture here. The spine, it's atish. The spine is giving firmness to the body. So we're talking about the backbone of the body. So here we pretty well can begin to understand why Satan would lie when the prime from the word atish is to close the eyes. Satan says, surely they'll be open. What it means, it will close your spiritual eyes and open your eyes of the world and that that it, um, it demands and so forth. But no one understand. It is not an unusual term for us to say this is the trunk of my body. Or what about your family? Many of you are proud of them. And some of us, we have maybe one or two that we would like to break a certain limb off. It's called a family tree. It's, it's not unusual at all. Now, let's, let's go on, if we may, for uh, Genesis 3, 6, that sixth verse, all right? And that sixth verse reads, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, now picture what's happening, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, aha, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now, there's one thing I want to make very clear, that they both partook of the same fruit. She simply indicated it to her husband and directed him to it. Now, again, is it unusual for God to mention men as trees. No, I, I, wanna, I really want to nail this one down. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 61, and let's pick it up in the third verse of that Isaiah chapter 61, and it reads, God speaking, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, that means because the Antichrist has taken over, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees, they might be called what? They might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now God planted trees, but it would seem that Satan had a little habit of planting trees also. I find it interesting that even in this same, in this same um, chapter, um, in verse 21 of, of um, 59, 
that it reads, and you won't have it, but I want to read it to you. The people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting. In other words, a branch of a tree. Christ himself was even called the branch. So again, think not just because the subject is tree. Now, now I have a question for you. Some might say, well, well, this is just a little bit steep. If we're talking about what I think he's talking about, conception and, um, and uh, people not retaining their virginity for the coming of Christ, uh, this is really kind of heavy. That's what God's Word states. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you observed as of yet the word apple and I guarantee you, as a student of the Hebrew, apple is not mentioned in the, transcript, the um, manuscripts either. No way you could translate any tree that has been mentioned thus far as apple. So, I wonder how many of you can remember back in your, oh yes, dear children, Eve ate an apple off of an apple tree. Lie, it's not there. You're lying to the children. Now, which is better in God's eye? That you teach truth or that you lie to little children and give them a warped view of what happened in the garden that they have to maintain most usually for the rest of their lives? And, and trust me, I have grown adult people that will write after a, a teaching such as this and say, well, I know the word apple is in there, just where is it? I mean, it's, they cannot shake off that that was, you know, a little child trusts the adults and the elders of a church. And it's very difficult to remove lies and false teachings from their mind after they're implanted there by people they trust. Um, well, we're just making points and and uh, winning friends and influencing people here. I I'm not saying this to insult anyone, but to shame you if that's what you're teaching. Contrary to the Word of God, I assure you the serpent would love that also. The picture of the apple and the tree and so forth when the whole thing is a lie. Okay, so now we get back to Genesis um, here, we are going to pick it up here in verse what? Let's go with verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, open to the ways of the world, sin. And they knew that they were naked. Uh-oh. The old backbone with the central nervous system running through it has already passed the little message up to the brain. That's where the knowledge of the good and evil is. That's why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was Satan himself. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, I can't help saying it. Aprons, uh, the, the word in the Hebrew for aprons is to girt themselves. Oh, no, honey. No, honey, they ate an apple, so they made a little mask to put over their little mouthy here. You see that? Yes, little fig tree, you know, and just put the little fig leaf right around their mouth. No, they made aprons to cover their private parts because of what they had just done. Now, let's not, let's not lie to children concerning God's word. It makes God very angry. And I'll tell you something. Jesus told you in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, not maybe you should learn the parable of the fig tree, but to learn it. And this is the very rock foundation of the parable of the fig tree. If you don't understand this, you're not going to understand any of Christ's other parables as it's written in Mark chapter 4 concerning this thing. And it's the reason that God speaks through Christ in parables um, to those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. They made aprons. They girded themselves. They covered their nakedness. Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Why? They sinned. They disobeyed. 
9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11. And he said, God, who told thee thou wast naked? Question. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Question. Well, naturally he had, because the evilness that Satan shared with he and the woman both made them ashamed. Verse 12, and the man said, The woman, the woman there, whom thou gavest to me with, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. It's all her fault. No lad, I'm trying to, uh, bless his hide, trying to pass it off and blame it on the woman when he was uh, supposed to be the one that would have kept it from happening in the first place. Understand, 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. I don't have to tell you what happened there. You can tell by the outcome of it. Listen to God. He'll explain it to you that might have difficulty. 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, you know who the serpent is? It's that old devil, the dragon, Satan. 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. In other words, that is a statement of degradation that Satan could never again um, uh, rise to a point of salvation or anything else. Verse 15. And I, how sharp are you? You know, can, do, can you listen to God's word without thinking of labels or what you've heard in the past and let God just speak? Let's do that. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Okay. Do you know what? Uh, we're talking about children here. That's what the seed of man is, okay? It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy. Satan knew that it would be from this woman that Christ would come. And God is saying, because you tried to destroy that, I will put enmity between thee, thy seed and the woman's seed, meaning Christ was nailed to his heels, were pierced. But Christ ultimately will crush the head of the serpent. And so it is. Well, how can we be sure that Jesus would teach something like that? Well, how about reading it? Let's go to the 13th chapter of Matthew real quickly here. The 13th chapter of Matthew, and you'll find that Jesus did teach that the serpent had seed or children here on earth. Even though you've got a bunch of these wackos, biblically illiterate, so-called teachers that would run around and tell you otherwise. Here it is for yourself in the good old New Testament, the words of Christ. And this has to do with the parable of the tares and the sower, and this is the parable Christ said, if you don't understand this one, you can't understand the rest. And it's true. Verse 37 reads, when, when the disciples ask him, why are you talking in parables, and what, are you, what is this parable of the sower in the garden? Verse 37, and he answered and he said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of the man. That is to say, the word of God was with God when the spirit moved and created the various races on the earth. The good. 38. The field is the world, so that you don't have any doubts. Now, he's not talking in a parable. He's explaining one. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children that from the conception, you know how children get here? From the conception of the wicked one. 39, the enemy that sowed them, oh, here we're going to find out. We're really going to be able to find out what really happened. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the serpent, that old dragon. You can find all of his names listed in Revelation chapter 20 in one uh, clause. 
string. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. Yes, it shall come to pass. Yes, Christ taught about uh, the children of the serpent. Yes, he did. And I make no apologies for it, nor should you ever have any desire to want to. Else, again, you wouldn't be able to understand any of, um, of the uh, parables of our Father. Okay, let's return, if we may, to the 16th verse of the third chapter of Genesis. I think that pretty well clears it up, does it not? We're talking about what happened in the garden and why they used fig leaves for an apron rather than a mask. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. What had happened? Conception. Do I need to define conception? I think not. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Verse uh, 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, rather than listening to God, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, that's where he sinned. It wasn't listening to his wife. It was not listening to God. Okay? That I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, period. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And man has had to grub out a living ever since. 18. Thorns also, and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Exactly as it's written, it has always been. There's nothing new under the sun. And if you don't understand what happened in the beginning, you're not going to understand the end. Verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return into the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, from dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so it is. Many people dream of these old bodies raising up and all that. No, they go back to dust. You raise in a spiritual body. 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living, only because it would be Christ that would come through her womb, and you either have Christ or you're not going to have eternal life. That's what it has reference to. That is to say, for all of God's children, all races, so forth. 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. There was blood shed because of that sin, and the skins taken to make clothing. 22, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take. I will caution you to note the word is not touch here, even in the English, and certainly not naga in the Hebrew. Take also of the tree of life, which is to say Jesus Christ himself, and eat and live forever. That means to partake of the word of salvation at that time and um, live forever before having earned the right to deserve, deserve salvation. Verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Verse 24, And so he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned in every way, all directions, to keep the way of the tree of life. Do you know what way that is? It's the same way that Christ said, I am the way. I am the way to the truth and, and to the resurrection. Do you want to have eternal life? Then don't lie about God's word. Teach it as it is written on a level that all people may understand. Gently, firmly. And certainly it is a part that you want a mature child's mind. There's nothing wrong with teaching a child the truth. That, quite frankly, there's no way they can understand the rest of God's word without understanding how it was in the beginning or to know what that parable meant, the parable of the sower. And Christ explains it in such a way that any child can understand it. Then they can begin to understand the controversy and the war that we have between Satan and the seed of the woman. That is to say, Christ and the children of God that try to follow God. There will yet be one more 
time that Satan will take an opportunity to destroy that woman through which Christ would come. We'll find it in the sixth chapter of this great book. I make no apology for God's word. It is very easy for you to check out the Hebrew by the, by the materials that I have submitted to you, even drawing you a picture and showing you the Hebrew, and in one case, the Greek, in this uh, particular lecture, and exactly what it means being fully translated rather than transliterated. God's word is true. It's simple. It's wholesome. And it's good. You never have to make any apologies for God's word. It brings about clarity, understanding, and a happy life, most of all, and along with peace of mind and eternal life. Never apologize for God's word to any man. It is written, and it shall come to pass exactly as it is written. The first prophecy concerning what would happen to Satan's head was listed in that 16th verse, 15th and 16th verse of that book of Genesis. That hasn't even happened yet, but it's going to. So some of what you were studying today is prophecy yet for another day. Don't miss any of these lectures, especially in the first six chapters of Genesis. They are very important. And again, I make no apologies for God's word, neither should you. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?